Sax repair shops seem to be an endangered species these days. There was a time in New York City where you could take your horn to any number of local workshops in the Times Square neighborhood and feel like you were in some sort of saxophone wonderland. I used to work in one of these shops on 48th Street fixing saxophones next to Manny's across the street from Sam Ash. All of these stores have either closed or relocated since but one of the legends is still going strong. I recently visited Roberto's on 46th. He and I talked about the old days repairing saxophones in one of the most exciting musical neighborhoods in the world. Hey. Hey, hey how's it going? Hey. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah man. Long time. Yeah, man. Tell me, how did you start fixing saxophones? Oh, that's, that's quite, a, quite a story, actually. Um, I was studying uptown in a jazz school trying to be a tenor player. I studied there for a while, I uh, was doing a waiter job to survive, and one day the guy from the school asked me if I would help him to build some studios on 46th Street, right across the street from here. Okay. When I was building them, there was a guy repairing saxophone next to me. It was Saul Frumpkin. Uh -huh. <laughs> the thing was Saul Frumpkin. So the guy saw me work and said, hey, you have good hands, do you want to work with me? And I was like, no, I want to be a saxophone player, you know, I don't want to be a mechanic. But, you know, I was watching, was because we were sharing the same entrance, so I was watching was going there. So Jackie McLean, Bob Berg, you know, all the guys. I was like, wow, this guy has to be good, because I didn't know him. A year later, I went back to him and say, you know what, I really would like to learn. Okay. Would you teach me? And what year was this? This is 1982. He gave me a very small salary. Uh -huh. He said, you know, when you start to produce for me, I'm going to pay you more. And, you know, I had a kid that time, Nicolo was, was born, and I studied with him for six and a half years. Right. And during that time, he got sick for like a few months, and people were coming in and saying, well, I need repair. I said, you know, I don't know what to do. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Until one day, Charles, McPher Charles McPherson, right, came in. He said, I need my horn fixed. And I said, Charles, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yes, you do. Come on, get down there. <laughs> he really pushed me. He guided me, like, you know, <laughs> moment by moment. And I started to, wow, I said, this is pretty cool. I mean, I was sweating. I almost wanted to cry. You know, it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and from that point on, I got more courage. And then until one day, you know, uh, somebody from Italy came. He had a big store in Florence. I would like to open a shop in Milan. You want to go partner with me? Because I was ready to go on my own. And I told Saul, I will never compete against you. I will never open a shop in New York because you're my teacher. I don't want to do this. I mean, mm -hmm. but I'm ready to go on my own. So I'm going, I'm going to Italy. And he said to me, well, I'm moving to Florida. I said, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> if you move to Florida, I said, I want to stay in New York. I mean, I want to be here. I said, you're crazy, you're never going to make it, this is terrible, this city, they take all your money, they never, you know, the old school kind of, a, sure. it was very really tough to be in, <laughs> it was really tough, I mean, I, I couldn't pay the rent, I was making like five bucks a day, nobody knew where I was, so yeah, it was yeah. really hard, but then it was like three or four months, the voice got out, and from there, there you and are. From there. <laughs> and when did you move here, because you've been here for a long time. I've been here since 2005. And the guy that owned the, the restaurant downstairs, it was Rosie O'Grady, he said, man, I see you work late at night, so you close after me. And I close like at 2 o'clock in the morning, sometimes I see you there working. I want a tenant like you, just move with me. So I started with one floor, then I got the second floor, and then I got this part too. Right, because now there's the studios. The studios. How many studios are there? There are 18 rooms now. Wow, okay, cool. Yes, it's really good. And yeah. it's always it's always packed. Fun. Yeah, it's, right. it's a good vibe. Yeah, a lot yeah. of musicians come and go. Yeah, and it's really a it's really a nice place. I love yeah, this. Well, it's great to have the musicians come in and practicing, rehearsing, and then you also got the shop for getting the reads or whatever. And they you meet, you know, they get. Oh man, what's going on? I saw you. I never see you. Blah, blah. It's, it's good. It's a good vibe that that goes around. That's one of the yeah. That's one of the things I miss about working in in repair shops is just being oh you know people coming in and it's very social yeah i want to slow down <laughs> yeah i mean i've you know i don't want to choose my work but it's like 
you know, I don't want to work like before. I used to work so many hours every day, well, you know, seven you, days a week. Someone else, day. you know, you got to start. Someone else, you know, is right. passing on the torch. And the now my son came in. Hopefully, he's gonna learn too, okay. and he's gonna take over. Every time I've ever come in here, you've been here. Yeah. Like I've never come <laughs> in here with you not <laughs> present. So thirty years is uh, many, a lot of years. Yeah. I still love. I mean, I would love to just repair saxophone. But then there is the business part, then there is everything else, and it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah. How has this neighborhood changed in the, this 30 years? Wow, <laughs> that's a million dollar question. <laughs> I mean, I remember in the, in the 80s, my fun time was walking on 48th Street, looking at the windows, looking at the saxophone, mm. there were new kings. Uh, Silver Sonic, there was every floor, it was amazing. I was just walking around, going to Manny's, uh, Baltimore was there, uh, Art Shell was there, and Silverhorn was there. It was like so many stores. It was really like Alex was there. It was a really good place. I mean, for a musician, a music club, just going around there, see the instruments. Now, if you go to 48th Street, <coughs> it's so depressing. It's like a ghost place. There's nothing. There is no a music store left. They just get rid of everybody. It was like shocking for everybody. I mean, Manny's has been the you know, iconic place. Yeah. It's done. Semesh. Semesh moved. Yeah. So everybody moved to a different location. Mm. I want to stay here. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I know that probably business will be better over there, but you know, this is. I worked here since 1982 right. in this block. It's home. <laughs> it's home. You know everybody. You know everybody. Right. You, know, right? you know, it's like <laughs> I, I can't. I mean, I remember different restaurants, stores, yeah. stories. It was. It changed so much in the last yeah. 30 years. Um, at the beginning, this place was kind of dangerous in a way. You know, there was everything happening, mm. and now it's becoming. It's totally tourist, yeah, it's a yeah, tourist it's nice. uh, Disney, spot. Disney, yeah, Disney, Disney, World, yeah. Disney World, really. I saw many, many big guys. I mean, when I was on the top, you know, I think everybody, every shop has get to a point where like the top shop of the moment. And well, I have, you can name it. I saw them all. One was Archie Shep, and he came in, and he's actually playing my saxophone, by the way. He bought, oh, yeah. two, he bought two of them, yeah. You know, from Sonny Rollins, Jackie McLean, Bob Berg, Michael Brecker, Lee Connitz, uh, you name it, everybody. Joe Anderson came one day and he said, oh, you know, they told me you're good. You know, can you fix my horn? And I, I fixed his horn. He was doing a recording. He was very clanky. He was happy. Then one day he came, he came to the shop. I said, Joe, what's up? Are you playing town? No. Are you doing a recording? No, I just came to see you. He flew all the way from California mm. for a repair. I was like, wow. He said, hey, that's the way we used to do. Mm. You know, there was a mouthpiece guy in Chicago. Everybody would go to him. Yeah. You know, if, if you're a good repairman, everybody would come to yeah. you. And I was like, that was, to me was a great honor. Is that one there? No. Yeah, this yeah, is one, one of them. This is the older one, yeah. The Roberto wins. You guys do alto and tenor. And soprano. And soprano, okay. And now, baritone too. Baritone too? Yeah. At the beginning, you know, I choose different material to make my horns. I use like Japanese brass that mm -hmm. is more expensive. They listen to me because sometimes the problem is communicating. You know, like with the soprano, I went nuts. I was, I was there in Taiwan. I was like, I need to put this insert that is like, Half a millimeter a day. He said, No, it doesn't work. Now, I'm telling you, it's going to work. <laughs> so, because this company sent me a saxophone, right? Mm -hmm. And I say, Well, it's good, but we need to do this and this. And we worked together. And like, after 10 years, I was really happy, you know? So it took 10 years for it to get to the level yeah, that you wanted it yeah, to be yeah, at. Yeah. Then, like, everybody can make a saxophone now. Right. They can go there. You know, these people, they. You tell them something, and what they and do. Put your name on it. Right, and then, and then they apply whatever change you make. They show it to somebody. Look, you know, we can do this. Right. And then you made the changes, but then they end up 
somebody else. Right, actually. and then someone else. So there is not, and I understand the way of thinking, that's the way they operate, so I'm not criticizing them, but. What is your favorite sort of saxophone to work on? Mark six. Yeah, I mean, I, and I knew you were going to say that, you know, <laughs> I was like, I know the answer to that already. I mean, all of, all of them. I love Kahn's, I love King's, uh, but I think my, my experience is mostly in Mark VI. Um, and, what, and so, would you say that's the horn you've worked on the most? I probably did... Um, over 2,500 overhauls on wow. Mark VI. So you know every variation, yeah. every little trick, every individual. And I have to say, and the best school of all has been the customers. You find everybody has a different need. Everybody has a different concept about the combination of notes, the fingering, and you learn. Whatever is in my beginning was sold, so gave me every, all the knowledge. But the customer really kicked my butt. Mm. I mean, there's some people, you know, it didn't make any sense to me sometimes. They'd be asking no, you because, things, you know. know, when I was young, I said, no, this is impossible, this cannot work. But then you work with them and you learn that everything is possible. Yeah. Everybody has different thing going. And, right. and you know, you'd be surprised how much musicians know. I mean, they know because yeah. it's their they're instrument, right? Yeah. And they're really into it. And they know, so a lot of them know the mechanics, know that they're, they're really, what they want, yeah. and if you can give it to them, this is right. another chapter you can add on to. Yeah. Wow, I'm doing something else today. I hope you enjoyed this little trip to what used to be Music Row in New York City. If you've ever visited any of the old shops in the neighborhood, share any stories you may have in the comment section below, good or bad. And also give a shout out to your favorite saxophone repair shop wherever you may be in the world. Be sure to click the thumbs up button and get yourself subscribed to the channel if you aren't already. Thanks for watching and see you again very soon in another Better Sax video.